I can't imagine putting animals over humans. Ever. That's just weird. It's people like you who make veganism look like a cult. Hmm. So I was recently involved in a Facebook discussion about whether or not ethical vegans should support and participate in animal gifting and organizations like Heifer International. I was honestly incredibly shocked by how many people were defending animal gift giving and organizations like Heifer International and then calling those who criticized it elitist, out of touch, privileged, and basically indicating that we didn't care about humans or issues of food access and poverty. The comment I just read was one of many that I found extremely troubling. I didn't realize how few people, apparently vegans included, understood the real issue and problems with giving animals as a form of hunger relief. So let's take a look at animal giving today and Heifer International in particular and why what they do is so harmful for sustainability, the planet, animals, and especially humans. First of all, if you don't know what animal gifting is or haven't heard of organizations like Heifer International, take a quick look at this. This is Alton Brown for Heifer International. My goat's not really missing. It went to a family somewhere in the world or even here at home. It went to people who really needed it. But why a goat, you might ask, or a cow, or a water buffalo, or bees? Why not send tractors if you want to help? Well, first, because in most of the uh, places of the world where Heifer works, the nearest gas station is a very long way off, and gas probably costs about $1,000 a liter. As for a mechanic, well, that's like in the next country. And let's face it, an animal has a much better engine, one that can move people's lives. You turn it on, it gives you milk, or, or wool, or eggs. It plows fields, it produces... How can I say this politely? Um, fertilizer that makes crops grow. It's like giving someone a small business because all of those products, the milk, the wool, the eggs, turn into income uh, for medicine, school, clothing, a better home, a sustainable livelihood. And the animals produce livestock because, you know, uh, animals make baby animals. That's what they do. Try that with a tractor sometime. So I'm going to break down my analysis of animal gifting and Heifer International today into two main parts. The first part is going to be a look at whether or not it's actually an effective method of hunger relief for communities in poverty and the places and ways that Heifer International actually works. And the second part is going to be looking at the ethics of animal gift giving from a vegan and animal rights perspective watch all the way through the end. I cover so many different points in today's video. And at the end, when I'm talking about ethics, I also include a few of these screenshots from my Facebook conversation and some of the claims people were making and my response to them. So if you want to hear an honest response to how that conversation went and what people were saying, stick around to the end. So the first thing to talk about is that animals aren't these magic factories or, um, you know, businesses as the video likes to portray because there's inputs that have to go in to making that sustainable and profitable for the families that are receiving animals as gifts. And those main inputs are resources such as food and water. Animals have to eat. They do not naturally just produce milk, eggs, you know, and, and in a sustainable manner. They don't reproduce without having the resources to grow and thrive. So here's the thing. If people are already having trouble feeding themselves and their communities and they lack money, resources, food, or land to grow their own food, then how are they going to get the resources to feed animals to then produce that food that they can sell or eat? Now, I frequently hear the argument that animals have the ability to graze on land that is unsuitable for growing crops and vegetables and that they don't need to be fed food, that they can survive just on that you know, grass or what they're able to graze on that unsuitable land. This is really a complete myth. If a family's land isn't good enough to grow vegetables or grains to feed themselves, that land isn't going to be good enough to sustain animals either. And those families are going to have to end up either growing or purchasing additional grain and food to feed to those animals before they get anything in return. A lactating dairy cow, for example, has an extremely high metabolism and to keep producing milk at a level that the family can get anything from it, they have to eat enormous amounts of food. They will have a very hard time 
maintaining their milk supply if they are only foraging. And we see this in most farming practices where in the US and around the world, animals and dairy cows especially are supplemented feed to keep their production levels high. Likewise, domesticated chickens will not lay that many eggs if they are not having an adequate well-rounded well diet that they're able to thrive off of. One article I found showed that even with backyard farmers in the United States where chickens are given free range of bright, plush, green grass fields to forage in, that foraging, they are still only able to provide themselves with about 50% of the calories and food they need, and farmers then have to supplement the other 50% of their food with grain or feed, or in some cases, intentionally buy and get, you know, um, slightly older fruit or things that are going to be thrown away that they can feed to the animals. Really quick, I just want to interject here and show you a few of the things I found just quickly Googling how much feed it takes to feed free range chickens that are foraging for their own food. And the information I found shows that it's extremely hard to do anything more than even break even with raising your own chickens. However, they're still having, having to find that additional grain or food or fruits and vegetable scraps, and those aren't going to be heavily available in impoverished communities that are already struggling to feed the people there. Many of the communities served by Heifer International in particular are in pretty desertified and drought-stricken areas. And the other problem with this is that animals drink immense amounts of water. A lactating dairy cow will drink 30 to 50 gallons of water per day. So if you're in a drought-stricken area, in impoverished communities, people are probably struggling to have access to clean drinking water for themselves. And when you add an animal, even a single dairy cow, let alone multiple dairy cow or multiple animals to that family, that is an additional mouth that they're having to provide fresh drinking water to. The reality is that overall, in general, whether we're talking about impoverished communities or more developed nations, animals are intensely uh, resource consumptive for relatively little output. They provide very few of the calories and even the protein worldwide compared to the percentage of land, water, food, and resource inputs that they use to create that much output. One meta-analysis from the UK found that on average in developing countries, animals only produce about 2 to 12% of the calories that are consumed in those impoverished nations. So that's the reality. No matter how much we think or the media portrays or animal agribusiness industry portrays animal protein as being extremely important and crucial to these developing nations, the reality of it is it's expensive, resource intensive, and isn't feeding people as much as we think it is. These communities are still getting the majority of their calories and even protein from plant-based food sources. Lactose intolerance is also a huge problem around the world, with 75% of the world's global population being lactose intolerant. And those numbers really increase when we look at black and brown communities around the world. So international aid organizations like Heifer International coming in and specifically helping communities or trying to encourage them to have dairy cows produce dairy either for themselves or to sell to their local communities is really not a healthy, safe, or effective form of getting minerals, nutrients, and calories to hungry communities when likely they're going to have problems digesting that food source anyway. I found on the Heifer International website a particular dairy development program in four East African countries. And I looked up what the prevalence of lactose intolerance in these specific four countries was. A meta-analysis in The Lancet found that these four countries in particular, starting with Kenya on the low end, had a prevalence of 39% across their whole country of lactose intolerance, which is lower than 75% for sure, but that's still almost half of the country that would be unable to safely consume dairy products. And then on the high end, Uganda, one of the other countries that this Heifer International program works in, has upwards of 87% of their population being lactose intolerant. So why are we supporting an international aid organization growing the dairy market and trying to feed more dairy and put more dairy into communities where 87% of their population is lactose intolerant? How is that 
helpful or beneficial or not a sign of Western imperialism driven development. Worldwide, the United Nations and the World Health Organization estimate that 75% of all of our infectious de disease is zoonotic in origin, meaning that it is coming from animal to human transmission. We are living in a pandemic situation right now as such that is a clear example of that. And we talk a lot about how factory farms also create the spread of this. Well, even more important than that is that close contact between humans and animals. In a factory farm setting, you have lots of animals confined, and that's extremely problematic for promoting the replication and spread of zoonotic diseases. But you don't have as much of that direct human to animal contact, where Whereas in communities with subsistence farming, you have a lot more human-animal interaction on a regular basis. And that human-animal interaction, especially when animals are sick, can spread disease very rapidly, infecting and harming lots of humans. In poor countries, analyses have found that 25% of all livestock either were previously or currently infected with bacterial and foodborne illnesses that infect people. These are things like tuberculosis, Q fever, bru brucellosis, if I'm pronouncing that right, which is apparently really common, salmonella related things. These infections that are a huge cause of death, sickness, and illness in humans. In the least developed nations, around 20% of all illness and death, all illness and death, is associated with disease transmission that is zoonotic in origin and likely extremely connected to the increase and in density and concentration of animals and livestock in these communities without the proper ways to deal with the diseases they bring. Climate change is also a major concern right now, and when we talk about zoonotic diseases, lots and lots of scientists are coming out sounding the alarm saying that one of the negative impacts of climate change is going to be the further spread of zoonotic diseases around the globe and the the lack of resilience and ability of communities to adapt and deal with this. Plus, climate change itself is going to increase the instability, food production, drought, um, you know, monsoons, all of these things that make it harder for already poor and impoverished communities to be self-sustainable and feed themselves. And so even, even if, all other issues aside, these programs of animal gifting actually did provide or really were beneficial in the moment for communities, they would still be trading off their long-term well-being and the sustainability of such practices for that short-term gain. Because animal agriculture is one of the leading drivers of greenhouse gas emissions. Moreover, desertification is caused by intensive animal grazing, and lots of these areas in sub-Saharan Africa that have increasing desertification are driven by the increasing animal agriculture and grazing that is going on there. And, and then the overgrazing and desertification impacts the ability of soils to also sequester and store carbon, which further leads to more climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. So all in all, adding more animals and, and supporting the growth of animal agriculture in these communities is really harmful to the people in the immediate and diverts resources that they could be putting towards more sustainable and healthy for them uh, food options. And then putting more animals in the community is also increasing their risk of more severe impacts from climate change in the long term, because we know that climate change impacts the most marginalized communities first. One final note on this is that if we are worried about supporting indigenous communities as well, Providing and helping communities shift to raising animals and livestock actually diverts resources and attention away from more traditional indigenous methods of farming and food production. In sub-Saharan Africa and places like Ethiopia, this is products like teff, millet, sorghum, maize even. These other grains that have way more phytochemicals, nutrients, and provide a good food source and are the traditional foods of those communities. And so when we bring the animals into the picture, then those communities are having to divert their resources away from the more traditional foods to then feed and support the animals to produce the more Western animal agriculture driven products. 
it would be much better to support programs such as Plants for Hunger and there, there's numerous growing vegan and plant-based food insecurity and hunger relief organizations that are doing the exact same thing but with plants instead of animals, which is far more sustainable in the long term, far more sustainable for these communities, far healthier for these communities, and of course it doesn't kill animals. And that brings me to my second part, which is the ethics of animal gifting. So is animal gifting uh, unethical or immoral? And there's a lot of ways we can look at this. But let's say, all things aside, animal gifting actually was really beneficial and helped communities that were food insecure. Let's say on the human and sustainability side it was good. Would it be ethical? From a vegan and animal liberation perspective, I would of course say no, because it still is promoting the exploitation, use, and property status of individuals that are sentient, living, feeling beings. So if we are truly against oppression and harm and want to create a world that is just and sustainable for all beings, we cannot help one community by exploiting another community. That goes against the ideas of total liberation and even intersectionality and just the general idea of, of being anti-oppression. Because no matter how helpful it is to those communities, which it's not, as I just showed you, we are still treating, especially this program, really treats animals as objects. You flip through their catalog and or scroll through their website and it's just like, oh, here's this object. Do you want to give this animal or this animal or this animal? It's straight up treating animals as objects that can be bought, sold, or in this case gifted to people to exploit and use for their purposes. That is speciesism and that is oppression. But I want to take this a step further now because as we've seen, animal gifting is not helpful to people. But if it were, would it be elitist or uh, privileged or judgmental of us as ethical vegans to not support animal gift giving? And so I wanna tell you a couple of things that happened in this Facebook conversation. It was in a vegan group where a vegan expressed uh, upset at the fact that Heifer International was so blatantly treating animals as objects. And some of the comments on this were things like, you know, it's just a bunch of privileged white vegans, or not everyone can go vegan. So let me read you a few of the comments so that you can see what these were actually saying. One person said, this is for people living in poverty. It sucks, but not everyone has the privilege to go vegan. And my response is, no one was saying the whole world has to go vegan. This was just a post acting upset about this organization and what they're doing to help people in poverty. And all these people are assuming that when we dislike Heifer International, it means we're like shaking our finger and saying, you over in that rural village in Uganda, you better go vegan. Like, no, I'm not over there preaching veganism to those people. That's not who my main target audience is. I can still criticize an international aid organization. And then there were comments like this from vegans. I used to raise money for this group all the time. Factory farming is not the same as this in any way. Here's the thing. Veganism is not about being against factory farming. Animal liberation is not about being against factory farming. The inherent principle of veganism is that we as humans had no right to oppress, exploit, and use other beings, humans or animals, for our purposes. So whether you are raising and killing an animal in confinement and terrible conditions, or whether you are raising and killing an animal on a small rural farm, does not change whether that's vegan or not, or whether that is good for the animal or not. One may be slightly less terrible than the other, but that doesn't make it good, that doesn't make it ethical, that doesn't make it vegan or supporting animal liberation. It is still oppression even when done by marginalized groups. In one case, I responded to someone who said that this was an organization that changed lives for people with a fact sheet that I'll link below from the organization A Well-Fed World that is a vegan hunger relief organization doing incredible work for both people and animals and the planet. And I shared that article that, that has all the reasons, similar to what I've talked about here, as to why gifting animals is bad for people. And in response to that, 
This person said, this is a link to a competing organization. So of course there is going to be information on why animal gifting is bad. Plant-based may make sense for some. I think it's a beautiful long-term goal, but the bottom line is both organizations can make a huge difference. Many in poverty can benefit from an animal because of their products pack a high protein, calorie, and fat punch that they need and can't get elsewhere. Plant-based diets only work well with a wide variety of options and supplements. Granted, food is food, but animals provide more substance for a longer period of time. And I, re I responded asking her, did you actually read this article? And she said, yes, but why do I believe that organization over Heifer International? And here's why. Because Heifer International is animal agriculture industry propaganda. They partner with and they have an agenda to push more animal agriculture in the communities. And that, and the things that they are pushing and doing are not backed by sustainability science and evidence. They are not backed by climate change data. They are not backed by the evidence of what is actually good and helpful in the long term. When it comes to health too, in the short term, animal products do have, you know, more fat and protein per calorie in many cases, but that doesn't make them healthy. And what we see from studies like the China study or blue zone research is that over time, when more indigenous and traditional localized diets start to, when those communities start to shift and eat more like the heavy standard American meat centric diet, they develop the chronic diseases that we develop. So sure, in the short term, maybe that seems more helpful or beneficial, but in the long term, these foods are not healthy for anyone. They are not healthy for humans. And plant-based is the more evidence-based way to be living. Then there's comments like this. I think it's disgusting when humans care more about animals than other humans suffering. Ridiculous. Literally no one on this post said that we care about animals more. So this is what's happening. A lot of people are taking vegan legitimate criticism of an organi organization that is actually harmful to people in many ways. And they're saying that it's disgusting if you're bothered by this and just using this privilege term, which I think privilege can be a very useful um, method of looking at certain issues, but not when it's weaponized just to discount criticism of something like this. There is nothing, nothing disgusting. Uh, there's, there's nothing wrong and it is not inherently privileged to be disgusted by oppression. Personally, I am disgusted and horrified by the oppression of animals and their use and being treated as objects. I am equally as horrified and bothered by the economic and world inequality and circumstances that allow for myself to be here living in the United States with an immense amount of privilege compared to these impoverished and food insecure communities that are having trouble even feeding their families. That is terrible. That is not going to be solved by giving these communities animals. And so yes, we do want to help people and I, I care about people too, but me not supporting Heifer International does not mean I care about animals more than people. I can care about both equally and I can seek to support programs that facilitate development and hunger relief in these communities that are also sustainable that don't degrade our environment, that don't introduce more disease into these communities, and that don't kill animals. So the ethics of, uh, of Heifer International are terrible. And the ethics of treating animals as objects to try and solve another oppressed group's hunger is trading one oppression for another. That will not get us to total liberation. That is not a truly anti-oppression perspective. If you enjoyed today's video and want to see more content like this, please go over to my website, bornvegan.org, which I've linked below, and sign up for my email list because I'm going to be send starting to send out regular emails with my latest videos, information, or even other blog posts as I ramp up in my content creation. And I would love your support in that. So uh, you can check that out below. And then of course, follow me on all of my social media platforms, including TikTok now, if you want to see short videos. All right, I will see you next week.